All right, welcome back, fellow scientists. So uh, last video, we talked about red blood cell anatomy. Basically, we talked about antigens and antibodies and the ABO blood groups and different things like that, uh, which, by the way, I just checked on YouTube. It looks like only two people have watched that. So I don't know if you're watching it in uh, LMS RenWeb and then it doesn't count towards the YouTube views. And it'll, yeah, so I'm not I'm not exactly sure. But I did notice that Shaylin uh, commented again with a different color. It was a very complex name, which I don't have uh, any any illusions of, of knowing or memorizing, but I looked it up, actually, Shailen, you're welcome, uh, and it looks like lavender to me. So we'll go ahead and use lavender for Shailen's request, uh, and then we'll just get going. All it is today is notes. There's not gonna be any homework assignment. Uh, so just kind of hang with me for 20 minutes, uh, and, then, and then you'll be good. So talking about red blood cell physiology today, so we have to start by talking about red blood cell formation. Uh, so red blood cell formation, you'll remember that all of our blood cells, all of our formed elements start as one stem cell, one hemocytoblast, uh, if that hemocytoblast uh, divides and then that, that new cell is destined to become a mature red blood cell, uh, the whole process takes about three to five days to become a mature red blood cell. Mature red blood cells are kind of unique. Uh, they have absolutely no organelles. So no nucleus, no mitochondria, which, by the way, is actually kind of cool because mitochondria does cellular respiration, right, which uses oxygen in the electron transport chain. Uh, so no mitochondria means that any energy that they do need, they get through the process of fermentation, which doesn't use oxygen. So they're not they're not stealing the cargo that they're carrying, right? It's not like you're the, the Frito-Lay uh, <laughs> chip truck driver. Uh, and then, you know, you, you, you sample the product on the way to the to the grocery store. You're taking bags of Frito-Lays and you're just, you know, kind of kind of chowing down uh, or whatever. So anyways, red blood cells don't do that. They don't they don't sip their cargo. They don't they don't sample their cargo. Uh, they just leave the oxygen and it, it goes to its, it goes to its destination uh, unharmed. Uh, so mature red blood cells, no organelles. It's just a bag of hemoglobin. Uh, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, they last 120 days, so 120 day lifespan. Uh, and then as they're approaching the end of their life, they become kind of like uh, more rigid and more brittle. Uh, and then eventually they just kind of break up uh, and your spleen. Uh, is actually the organ that liver to to a small extent, but your spleen is actually the organ that takes care of these dead red blood cell pieces. Uh, so your spleen is known as the red blood cell graveyard. Dun dun dun. Red blood cell graveyard. All right, cool. Uh, so now that we kind of like have just very briefly touched on that process. Let's go to how your body knows how to make more red blood cells. So uh, if your kidneys sense that there is a decreased availability of oxygen, right, uh, then they're going to make this chemical called urethropoietin. Urethropoietin goes and stimulates red bone marrow found in the flat bones and in the uh, proximal epiphysis uh, of long bones, right? And then that chemical, that hormone, uh, stimulates the red bone marrow to make more red blood cells, more red blood cells, increase the oxygen carrying capacity, uh, resolving our teeter-totter uh, back to back to normal levels. So that's a homeostatic imbalance that the body has to deal with often and is uh, is easily easily taken care of. All right, so uh, oxygen, right, uh, is is essential for for muscles, for endurance athletes, uh, for them to keep going, keep going, keep going because they need it for cellular respiration. And we talked in our muscular unit about fast twitch and slow twitch and how slow twitch have a lot of mitochondria and fast twitch have a have a lot of creatine and a lot of glucose and stuff like that. It's just really, really quick, really fast energy, right? Uh, so if you're an endurance athlete, you want a lot of red blood cells, right? Uh, there's one very famous endurance athlete who you guys may or may not recognize, uh, Lance Armstrong, who won seven uh, Tour de France 
races, right? The the longest, hardest, best, biggest uh, endurance event, I would argue, uh, cycling event, at least, uh, in the world. He won seven of them, uh, and then he retired. Uh, and then he was convicted by the International uh, Anti-Doping Agency uh, of actually uh, doping while he was while he was uh, involved in competitive cycling. And so his seven titles were stripped from him. But no one knows, you know, the other people that 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 won, because uh, yeah, because we're not we're not all cyclists. Uh, but anyways, I want to just kind of kind of branch off of how red blood cells are made uh, to how it affects uh, performance and how it affects athletes. Uh, so Lance Armstrong, he did two things. Uh, he or his doctors or whatever uh, injected himself with uh, erythropoietin, which is affectionately referred to as EPO. Uh, and so, of course, that then uh, went into his bloodstream and made uh, his flat bones and his his red bone marrow basically make more red blood cells, which gave him more oxygen carrying capacity, which then he could race uh, longer, faster, stronger. Right. Uh, second thing that he did is called blood doping. I think I talked about this before. So blood doping, he basically donates blood to himself. So a month before a race, uh, he takes blood out, right? Stored in a refrigerator, stored in an IV bag. Maybe they spin it down just to kind of condense it to the to just the red blood cells, right? Uh, and then during that month, uh, in between when he donates the blood, when it comes out of his body, and then when he's going to race, then the body just kind of naturally makes more red blood cells. Well, then the day or the night before the race, then he takes this blood that he that he donated, that he took out of his body, and puts it back into his body. So he donates it back to himself. Uh, and now he has uh, way more red blood cells, so way more oxygen carrying capacity, way more endurance, uh, better, better endurance athlete, right? Uh, so these things are, like I've said, illegal, and that's why Lance uh, got stripped of his seven Tour de France titles. And the main reason, from the articles that I've read, the main reason why they're illegal is because they're dangerous. Because if you artificially increase your red blood cells uh, in your blood, it makes your blood thicker, and you're at an increased risk for heart attack and for stroke. Uh, so that's a bad thing. Now, the article that I read uh, also said that you can you can basically achieve the same effects through a hypoxic tent, right? So hypoxic tent, uh, hypo below, and then ox, you can kind of hear oxygen, right? So this is a tent that simulates uh, sleeping at high altitudes, at low oxygen levels. So if you're an endurance athlete and you really want to get like the most oxygen carrying capacity that you can in your blood, uh, you sleep in this hypoxic tent, right? And then you go and you train at sea level uh, or close to sea level, where there's lots of oxygen, where your muscles can, you know, use that and take advantage of that and, and build that. And then you go back and then you sleep in the hypoxic tent and your body, because it's a natural, because your body kind of naturally senses and your body's doing it to itself, that it's in low oxygen. Uh, this is not dangerous. And so this is totally allowed by all of the international uh, agencies and sports agencies and different things like that uh, as a way to increase uh, red blood. And the article that I read says that it has basically the same effect as artificial EPO uh, and then um, blood doping or giving giving blood to yourself. So I thought that was kind of interesting. If any uh, endurance athletes out there, uh, cross-country runners, marathoners, triathletes, something like that, if you want, really want to get an edge uh, up on your competition, uh, then this is, this is the training regimen uh, for you. All right, but I digress. We got to go back. We got to talk about red blood cells. Uh, so the next thing that we have to talk about is a protein called hemoglobin. All right, so hemoglobin uh, is the main oxygen carrying protein in red blood cells. Probably spelled carrying wrong, I apologize. Protein in red blood cells. See, that's where I love being in class because you guys would totally just jump on me and correct me, and, and I love it, but now I just have to suffer in my ignorance. Uh, so main oxygen carrying protein in red blood cells. So this is kind of an artist's uh, rendition of the hemoglobin molecule that's in red blood cells. Uh, interesting to note that there's about 250 uh, million thousands, that's hundreds, right? 250 million uh, hemoglobin molecules. Uh, 
uh, in one red blood cell. Uh, and then for every, oh, how do I wanna say this? For every one milliliter, uh, these are numbers from your book, by the way, so you know that they're true. Uh, in every one milliliter of blood, it's a really, really small, tiny amount, one milliliter of blood, uh, there are five million, about approximately five million, uh, red blood cells. Right, and you'll remember that the total blood volume for a normal adult is like five or six liters, right? And so um, a liter, uh, that's our base unit for volume. So a milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. Uh, so you start doing the math and it just becomes mind boggling, right? Uh, and then, okay, so add add this to that mind boggling math and it becomes even, even more mind boggling that there's four different subunits in one hemoglobin molecule. And each of those subunits contains a heme group, which is the oxygen carrying molecule. Uh, it has the iron atom, which gives it the, which gives blood its reddish color, right? Uh, so for every one hemoglobin molecule, it can carry four molecules of oxygen. So then if we know that we have 250 million hemoglobin molecules per one red blood cell, that means that one red blood cell can carry approximately one billion molecules of oxygen. And then if we just extrapolate that into 5 million red blood cells per milliliter and five to six liters in the whole human body, I mean, we're talking like the trillions, gazillions, right, of, uh, of oxygen molecules uh, at any one time in your, in your bloodstream. So that's just kind of mind boggling to me. Maybe it's not to you, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd bring that up. All right, so to, to really dive, to really get in depth in the hemoglobin molecule, we gotta remember all the way back to regular biology, uh, types of pro, um, protein structures, our levels of protein structure. So we have our primary structure, which is simply the sequence of amino acids, right? And you remember that that's determined by the RNA with the codons and the anticodons and the mRNA and the tRNA and the ribosome, right? And if we take a step back from there, the mRNA gets its sequence from the DNA, right? And so you remember the central dogma of biology. So we have our DNA, which makes our RNA, which makes our proteins, right, right here then that gives us our traits and that gives us our characteristics. So that makes you. So that's our primary structure determined by our DNA, right? And then that based on the sequence of amino acids, then the, the string of, of amino acids will either fold into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet, right? And then based on that, the secondary structure and the primary structure, then it'll be like a three dimensional shape uh, of one chain Right, so notice we have a C terminus right here and we have an N terminus right here. So that's one chain. Some proteins are just one chain and so they'll just kind of stop right there. Right, Some proteins like hemoglobin are actually made up of more than one chain. Hemoglobin is made up of four different chains. Uh, so we'll actually have a quaternary structure, which is the three dimensional shape uh, of more than one chain. Right, So uh, then knowing that, now we can go on and we can interpret this diagram right here. So this is a ribbon diagram. And we can see lots of alpha helixes and then a couple of beta pleated sheets in there. These green molecules, these are the heme molecules. So that's the oxygen carrying stuff. And we can see that we have two blue uh, ribbon diagrams. Uh, let's just say that those represent the alpha uh, globin. Uh, and then we have two blue, or sorry, two red ribbon diagrams. And we'll just say that those represent the beta. Globin. So two alpha globins, two beta globins make up one molecule of hemoglobin. All right, so that's normal. All right now, let's look at a common disease, at least it's uh, commonly known, called sickle cell anemia. So uh, one chain has 146 amino acids. Uh, and of those 146 amino acids, uh, if we take amino acid number six, Right, and if it normally in normal hemoglobin it's glutamine or glutamic acid, right? In sickle cell hemoglobin, uh, that changes to a valine, right? Which you can see it's a different structure, different different chemical properties. Uh, so that one teeny 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 tiny change uh, is enough uh, to change. Of course, it changes the primary structure because we're because we're changing one of these amino acids to be something different. That's enough under certain conditions, under low oxygen conditions, to change the secondary structure and the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Uh, so people with sickle cell anemia, 
uh, for the most part, their red blood cells will be will be normal. But then if they're under low oxygen conditions, uh, like if they ha are having respiratory distress uh, or if they are sprinting, right, if they're winded uh, or if they're at high altitudes and their red blood cells don't have a lot of oxygen, that one change is enough to go from this normal uh, to this abnormal. Right. If we zoom out a little bit, it goes from this. Right to this. Normal people without sickle cell anemia, they are under low oxygen conditions and their hemoglobin just stays like this and their red blood cells just stay like this. But if you have sickle cell anemia, then it changes to this and changes to this and then changes to this under low oxygen conditions. So uh, you'll notice that uh, these red blood cells, right, the tube that it's going through, the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels in your body, uh, they're just big enough to let one red blood cell squeeze through. And you'll notice the red blood cell looks kind of like a donut, right? No sharp edges, right? Nothing really to get stuck on. It just kind of just kind of goes with the flow. Uh, but then the sickle celled uh, red blood cells, they have like little hooks or they have, you know, little places to catch on. And so they'll make these little clots in these small, tiny little capillaries, uh, which of course are bad and, and cause, yeah, all sorts of, all sorts of problems. So, uh, I know I'm geeking out on this a little bit. I know this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but stick with me. Uh, so I want to talk about genetics of SCA because this is a really, a really cool example of something called heterozygote advantage. Uh, so sickle cell anemia is a recessive disorder. Recessive disorder. Uh, so if you have the genotype, big A, big A, uh, you have no sickle cell anemia. Uh, if you have the genotype little a, little a, uh, you have sickle cell anemia, All right, which is normal. Okay, so this normal individual, this under low oxygen conditions, then all of their red blood cells, the red blood cells experiencing those low oxygen conditions, uh, they'll turn into sickle shapes and they'll, they'll create clots. Uh, if you have big A, little a, if you're heterozygote, right, uh, you, you make half of your hemoglobin is normal. So under low oxygen conditions, uh, it's not going to turn sickle shape. Half of it is abnormal, but these are enough to pick up the slack for these, right? So they don't really have any physiological uh, abnormalities or, or uh, detriments, basically. Uh, but as it turns out, that these people are actually resistant to malaria. resistant to malaria. So the reason why that is, is because part of the life cycle of the malaria uh, parasite is spent in the red blood cell. And in there, they're using up the oxygen. And so they're causing that red, red blood cell uh, to become sickle shaped, right? If, if, they, if they're in the heterozygote uh, condition. Because remember, it's not red blood cells uh, that, that are the determining factor of the sickle shape. It's the hemoglobin. So half the hemoglobin molecules are going to be are going to be normal. Half the hemoglobin molecules are going to be uh, abnormal. So so when as that as that pathogen makes low oxygen conditions in that red blood cell, uh, then it makes it sickle shaped, uh, and the body senses that that's that's bad, and so it gets rid of it. It, uh, it it degrades it, and so along with that, then the malaria pathogen is gotten rid of and destroyed uh, and degraded. So that's actually kind of cool. Uh, Hanbi, by the way, uh, gets uh, extra credit points uh, for asking the best question on the discussion board about blood type. Uh, why is type O uh, the most common, but then uh, recessive? And I looked it up and there's no, there's no firm answer on that. Uh, but then this, you would ask a similar question. Why is a detrimental allele? Why doesn't evolution just kind of get rid of it? Um, one answer would be that it hides in the heterozygote, right? So if this is dominant, then they have no ill effects. And so it just kind of hides and it can get passed on. Uh, but then another answer uh, is that it actually confers this allele right here, if it's in the heterozygote, it actually confers an advantage to the person uh, who has it in that they're resistant to malaria. So that's kind of cool. I just thought that I'd, that I'd mention that. All right, last slide. Thanks for hanging in there. I appreciate it. Uh, we talked a little bit about this with uh, respiratory, with our respiratory unit, but I just want to come back to it, and I just want to kind of connect the dots. So here's our adult hemoglobin. We have two betas and we have two alpha chains, right? And here's our uh, oxygen affinity curve uh, for regular adult hemoglobin. 
And I think I mentioned this before, but fetal hemoglobin uh, ha actually has a higher affinity for oxygen, right? And that's because it has a, a slightly different uh, shape made of slightly different different chains, and so it has a different function, right? So it still has our two alpha subunits, but then it has, instead of two beta subunits, it has two gamma subunits. Uh, so different different uh, structure, different primary sequence of amino acids for these gamma uh, subunits, different uh, secondary, different tertiary, different quaternary structure, right? Because we have our, we have our different subunits. So different shape equals different function. Um, so that's just something kind of kind of cool uh, to notice. Uh, and then uh, I think we talked about this when we talked about muscles, but there's also a similar protein known as myoglobin. Myoglobin is just one chain, right? You can see it kind of it kind of starts here and then it it kind of ends ends here, right? Uh, or actually maybe it ends here, red and blue. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so anyway, it starts here, ends here, C terminus, N terminus. Uh, it doesn't really matter which is which, but anyways. Uh, so this is just one chain. So it is a, it just stops at the tertiary structure at the tertiary level. And we can see that it actually has more affinity for oxygen than any of the hemoglobins, right? And so that's how we get oxygen from the bloodstream into our tissues, right? One is process of simple fusion because our tissues are using up the oxygen. And so there's going to be less oxygen in our tissues and more oxygen in our bloodstream. And so a simple process of diffusion, we're gonna go from a higher concentration bloodstream to lower concentration in our tissues. Uh, but then another thing is that our tissues have this myoglobin molecule, which is basically oxygen hungry, like it sucks the oxygen out of the blood because it has a higher oxygen affinity. All right, and then last thing that I wanna mention, uh, so here's maternal, here's normal hemoglobin, here's fetal hemoglobin, we see that kind of lines up. Uh, and then interestingly enough, llama hemoglobin, is even slightly different from fetal hemoglobin in that it has a higher oxygen affinity even than fetal hemoglobin. And the reason why is because llamas tend to live at higher altitudes in the world. And so the air is thinner up there. And so they need uh, a greater oxygen carrying capacity if they're going to be able uh, to live. Humans live anywhere from like the Sherpas, you know, up in Mount Everest all the way down to, you know, coastal tribes and peoples. Uh, Seattle and Oregon and, and different things like that. Um, so so we live we live anywhere and we're not we're not llamas. They're kind of they're kind of originator. They're kind of uh, found mainly in in higher altitudes. So God gave them a different type of hemoglobin uh, that is that is better suited to that environment. Now whether he did that like poof like different hemoglobin or whether he used natural selective processes to the process of natural selection and evolution remains to be remains to be figured out it's not really a big deal as long as you acknowledge that god is the creator and is the maker and is in control uh, of all our lives uh so that's it for red blood cell physiology this has been mr leo i hope this has been enjoyable and informative and i will see you on the flip side